Hi everyone, I'm Rosemary Miller. In the nation's very first, Office for Missing and Murdered Black Women and Girls will be signed into law in the state of Minnesota. And today we have the woman who's making it all possible, Representative Ruth Richardson. Thank you so much for joining me today. You're welcome. Thank you for having me. Absolutely. So, Representative, we spoke a few months ago and you did lay out the stats, but for those who weren't able to watch that video, could you just tell us once more, what are the statistics? Yeah, we know that there is definitely a crisis as it relates to missing and murdered Black women and girls within the United States. Uh, the statistics are startling. The There is somewhere between 64,000 and 75,000 Black women and girls that are currently missing within the United States. And what that range tells us is that we don't even know the extent we don't even know how many Black women and girls are missing uh, within, within this country. Uh, but we know when Black women and girls go missing that their cases stay open four times longer than cases involving their white peers. And we also know that uh, Black women are over four times more likely to die from homicide. And one of the really, um, I think, striking and also just startling statistics is over the last couple of years, we have seen just an increase in cold cases involving uh, Black women who have died by homicide. That cold case rate has increased 89%, which is more than any other demographic. So it's a true crisis that we have within the United States. Right. That's, oh, wow. Representative, what will your office do to, to alleviate some of that? So the design of the office is really, uh, it's really about creating uh, a structure that involves multiple pathways. Um, at, the, at the top of this work is prevention. How do we prevent uh, the, the issues that we know that are often tied to these disturbing statistics? Um, here in Minnesota, Black women make up less than 8% of the population, but they represent over 40% of the reported domestic violence cases. So as we begin to think about ways that this office will be operating, there'll be prevention efforts, prevention efforts around uh, addressing domestic violence, prevention efforts uh, around addressing human trafficking. Uh, Black women and girls are oftentimes uh, more likely to be targeted uh, for trafficking. And we've heard really startling uh, admissions from people who've been convicted as traffickers, but oftentimes they're targeting Black women and girls because the perception is that you won't be caught or you'll get less time for that. So prevention will definitely be one of the efforts. But we're also focused on cold cases as we continue to see this increase in the number of cold cases involving Black women and girls. We want to make sure that there are resources, trained law enforcement resources that will be a part of this office to help address that cold, uh, that cold case piece to ensure that families have access to the answers that they need and frankly that um, they, they deserve as well. Training will be a part of this and also thinking about community outreach and engagement because this is work that it takes a village to do. So it's going to be uh, important that there's meaningful engagement with the nonprofits and community based organizations and the faith community to be a part of solving this uh, crisis as well. So I want to know how how will you all be able to ensure that the officers you have involved are actually reviewing these cold cases? So one of the ways that we're going to do that is there's a lot of reporting and data requirements that are going to be a part of this office. We are going to, for the first time in this state, to be able to ensure that we have accurate data around the number of Black women and girls that go missing within uh, our state. 
accurate data around the number of homicides and will have the ability to be able to track uh, cold cases um, as, as well. So there will definitely be uh, data requirements that will be able to measure the effectiveness uh, of, of the office. And, and one thing that I neglected to mention before that I think is also really important, this office um, will also establish a missing persons alert system. So when a black uh, woman or girl goes missing, they will get a missing person uh, alert. Right now, we have a real challenge within our system as it relates to Amber Alerts mm -hmm. um, and, and, black, uh, and black girls. And I think it's important that people understand that when a child is classified as a runaway, they don't get that Amber Alert. And when you don't get that Amber Alert, you don't get the media attention, you don't get the community attention, and you also don't get law enforcement's uh, attention. And so having a system that has an actual alert that goes out is going to be very critical um, as we know, the first 48 hours are often going to be determinative as to whether an individual is going to be found and brought home safe or if it's going to become a recovery mission. Wow. So before we get into the media coverage, I do want to get into the numbers. Um, I saw nine hundred. And $48,000 uh, will be used to operate the office and $300,000 uh, will be used for grants for community-based organizations. So where is this money coming from? Sure. So this money is going to be coming from the, the general fund of the state of Minnesota. So this is an investment that uh, of $1.24 million a year that the state of Minnesota is going to be investing not one time, but ongoing year over year in order to address this crisis. Um, it's also important to know that the way that uh, we designed the office and I pushed for this because it was very important, was to also ensure that the office would be able to accept donations from those uh, foundations and others who are committed to doing this work. And they are also empowered to uh, seek grants. Uh, they have the authority to do that and to ensure that the money that is brought in goes into a special revenue, revenue account that is dedicated to this work so that it can't be siphoned off to do other things. And so um, it's really important that that base funding that we have, it's just base funding, but we know there's more that is gonna be needed to do this work and the structure is there to be able to have that private uh, public uh, partnership. And so was there any pushback? I'm curious, was there any pushback in Minnesota to this bill? Absolutely, there was pushback uh, to, to this bill, which is really unfortunate because when we're thinking about addressing a crisis of missing and murdered Black women and girls, it should be a nonpartisan issue and it should be something that everyone should be able to get uh, behind. And when I brought this bill to the House floor, I believe there were 13 members that did not vote in support of the bill. Mm. So our body is made up of 134 members. So there was vast bipartisan support uh, for this work, but there were 13 uh, members of the Republican Party who chose not to vote for the bill. Oh, wow. Well. My colleagues and I, we did a little test because in light of missing white woman syndrome, uh, we took this Columbia Journalism Reviews. They have this, are you press worthy test? And I want to read you our stats. So I took it. I'm 25 black and in New York. I am worth eight news stories. Um, there was another young lady. She's 22, Hispanic, and in New Jersey, she was worth 23 news stories. Another young lady was 26. She's Asian in New York. She's worth eight news stories. And the last one, she's 23, white and in New York, and she is worth 67 news stories. So <laughs> from our little, our little game, we wanted to know what can the media do to give more equal coverage? You know, it's such an important question and, um, as as you were reading through the numbers, I'm not surprised, which is 
sort of the sad reality that comes with all of this. It's it's not surprising to see that disparity. Um, and, and frankly, that's why our cases stay open four times longer. But I think one of the most important things that the media outlets can do is to have a policy around how they cover missing person cases and how they cover cases of homicide. Uh, because oftentimes there is sort of no rhyme or reason to it. And what it comes down to is just sort of this idea of discretion. And it's like, well, I think you're worth this many news stories um, and now we're done um, versus I think we this needs to continue to be in the news on a continual on a continual loop. And so I think when you have a, a space where there's actually a policy around these things, it forces people to have the really difficult conversations around why they are making the decisions that they're making. So how do we go about creating that policy? Well, like, would we go through unions? What what do we do? Yeah, well, and I think part of this, it's really important that there be this internal conversation that um, uh, the, the media is having. So not only with those who are ultimately writing stories or who are presenting stories, but also thinking about like engagement with the community talking with people who have had their loved ones where they didn't get that closure, they didn't get those answers, and being able to think about this, not in a vacuum of what do I think is going to um, get the most ratings, but to think about the humanity of this. And to also think about the various ways that individuals who are missing, or if there are cold cases, that that information could get out. You know, I, I've heard some folks in media say, well, there's so many people that go missing, um, you know, in a run of a year. How, like, how do we cover everyone um, in, in an equal way? Mm -hmm. And it definitely is a challenge, but I know that we can do better than what we are experiencing um, today. And maybe that's having a, a ticker that runs across the bottom of the screen, right? Um, maybe there is um, each week you're highlighting um, a, a cold case and you're paying close attention to who you're highlighting and making sure that it is uh, representative of the states that folks live in um, as right. well. It definitely is an easy work and there's no blueprint for this, right? Mm -hmm. And that's been part of the uh, that's been part of the challenge. And I think that's why this office is going to be so important because this office creates an infrastructure and a blueprint for action. And there is that opportunity for training. There's that opportunity for technical assistance with law enforcement and with the media to begin having those really uh, um, important questions. But if you don't have a policy around this, we know what that means. That means that the stories of people who look like us are oftentimes going to be marginalized or ignored. Absolutely. Having a blueprint is so important. And I really like that idea of highlighting at least one cold case a week. I really like that idea. Well, Representative, uh, could you could you name some organizations and foundations that our audience could could use to support some of these missing and murdered Black women? I really want to lift up uh, today the Black and Missing Foundation. There is actually a 5K that is coming up in June, June 3rd uh, in, in Maryland that uh, I, I'm going to be uh, attending and encourage folks to learn uh, about the Black and Missing Foundation because they are doing incredible work and their work touches across the uh, entire United States. They have been a lifeline for so many families here in Minnesota and within other states. And what we oftentimes find, and we, you know, we talked a little bit about this in our first interview, one of the trends that I was hearing when I um, started uh, 
with first creating the nation's first missing and murdered Black women and girls task force to now creating the SAM new office, was hearing this experience of families that were forced to undertake their own investigations. And oftentimes they were doing that on their own without any support. And what's really great about the Black and Missing Foundation is it comes with uh, a former law enforcement officer. So she knows, uh, you know, the, the ins and outs of law enforcement, um, Derricka Wilson, and, and, and Natalie Wilson is a whiz when it comes to the media piece and getting uh, the, the um, media attention on social media and being able to lift things up. And their work has helped to bring answers to hundreds of families, more than 400 families so far, and they are just getting started. And so I um, really encourage people, if they don't know about the Black and Missing Foundation, to get to know them. Okay. Well, thank you so much for doing this with me, Representative. Thank you so much for lifting this up. I appreciate the opportunity. Yeah.